One of the most central tenets of Stoicism can be captured from this line by Epictetus. Our chief task in life is simply this, to identify and separate matters so that I can say clearly to myself which are externals, not under my control, and which have to do with the choices I control. Where do I find good and evil then? Not in externals but within myself from the choices that are my own. After applying this to relationships, I observed how so much of what affects us, especially when we're in love, is beyond our control. For starters, that euphoric feeling you get when you speak to think about, see your loved one. Most of us confuse that with love and end up bouncing from one relationship to another, craving more and more of that feeling. Forgetting that eventually, in order for a couple's love to mature, it's actually essential for that phase to pass. We instead keep falling in love instead of growing in it. However, if looked at it closely, we'd notice that this feeling is not in our control. It just happens. There are psychological reasons for it, but, to a larger extent, we cannot control the flow of that feeling. Only once we let go of feeling good all the time, can we start focusing our energies on something more important, and yet, rare. Being a good enough, virtuous partner which means understanding oneself, one's partner, being empathetic, listening, staying present with them, and in a way, understanding what loving someone really means so we can grow in it. For me, this meant being aware of my own wounds and biases stemmed from my past relationships, so I don't repeat them again. It would be unfair to my present partner if, for instance, I didn't trust her just because one of my partners in the past cheated on me. Of course it's a risk, but, as Stoics, our job is to do as our nature demands to be good. Nothing else matters. If you have another opinion about love, share your comments and feedback with us so that the benefit can be spread. Stoicism, to some extent, has always had a bad reputation of being too tough. In fact, if you Google the word stoic, this is the first meaning that pops up. A person who can endure pain or hardship without showing their feelings or complaining. And yet, if one decides to study and implement stoic lessons into her daily life, she will realize how profoundly incorrect that definition and reputation is. Yes, of course, we endure pain and hardship, but not without showing, exercising, meditating over our feelings. We do it because it's the right thing to do because our nature demands for it, because after some serious thought and journaling, we believe that our actions will make a difference. When Marcus got the news of Cassius, his most trusted general, rebelling in Syria and declaring himself Caesar, what was his reaction to this betrayal? He did not let his feelings affect his decision. Despite it all, he still did the right thing. First and foremost, he did not speak ill of him. Then to deal with the tension that was affecting his city, he told his men to capture Cassius, but not kill him. Further, after resolving this problem, he chose not to punish anyone involved in the conspiracy. Simply put, he decided to take personal responsibility. Later, he would brilliantly meditate over this in his journal. I have seen the beauty of good and the ugliness of evil and have recognized that the wrongdoer has a nature related to my own, not of the same blood or birth, but the same mind, and possessing a share of the divine. Yes, it's horrible that my past partners cheated on me, but what am I going to do about it? Feel sorry for them, decide whether or not I want them to be a part of my life anymore, and go inward to make sure I can heal, with time. Ask yourself, are you showing your partner kindness? only if certain conditions are met? Or, are you doing your job and loving them with all your heart? Implementing this requires heart. For some of us, at least, that means fixing a wounded one. Either way, it's a self-transforming journey, one where we can heal and rediscover the goodness of people. The art of giving space in a relationship is something we must learn and practice regularly. Regardless of how much in love we are with our partners, in order for the relationship to thrive, a sense of independence needs to be established between your partner and you. Here again, Epictetus shines some light. When you are delighted with anything, be delighted as with a thing which is not one of those which cannot be taken away, but as something of such a kind, as an earthen pot is, or a glass cup. 
that, when it has been broken, you may remember what it was and may not be troubled. What you love is nothing of your own. It has been given to you for the present, not that it should not be taken from you, nor has it been given to you for all time, but as a fig is given to you or a bunch of grapes at the appointed season of the year. But if you wish for these things in winter, you are a fool. So if you wish for your son or friend, when it is not allowed to you, you must know that you are wishing for a fig in winter. How can one attempt to give enough space? This process can be two folds. First, we should remember that despite what the romantics say, our purpose on earth is not to live for our partner, that Cupid doesn't really give a shit or that he doesn't exist. Our purpose, therefore, is to try and make this world a better place with our work. Now, whether you're a fireman or a freelance writer, it's up to you to decide how you can leverage the power of your field of practice to make a difference. In relationships, it's common for most of us to forget ourselves and our priorities for the beloved. This is especially relevant during the initial phase. That is something, however, that should be avoided. We're here to change lives until death gives us that humble call. Second, we need to learn to be grateful and exercise that mindset daily. Odds are, your partner and you have done things, do things that makes life easier and more livable. In essence, we need to tell our partners how grateful we are for them and for the things they do for us. This can help us understand that these nice things aren't a given. Fate can decide to flip the card at any moment. However, while things are good, as long as we're fortunate enough to see our partner every day, we can appreciate it and be grateful for it. Reiner Maria Rilke, 1875-1926, the Austrian poet and novelist put this perfectly in his book, on love and other difficulties. I hold this to be the highest task of a bond between two people, that each should stand guard over the solitude of the other. It's a sad fate for a man to die too well known to everybody else and still unknown to himself. Seneca. Your task is not to seek for love, but merely to seek and find all the barriers within yourself that you have built against it, Rumi. Whether you trust a Roman playwright or an Afghan poet, the insights remains. Self-knowledge, like in many areas in our lives, is essential if we want to learn how to love. More often than not, after the honeymoon phase subsides in a relationship, little arguments start turning into big red flags in our brains. Our partners are not what we thought they were, or so it seems. Suddenly, interests don't align anymore, and things that first seemed cute are now broadly labeled as coincidental. The more obvious inclination at that time is to believe in a rather naive claim made by your mind and heart, that this person is not the one. We've fallen into the wrong camp, and our puzzle pieces don't align with theirs. Now, if we follow that voice, we can end up falling into the same cycle over and over again, hoping to gain that blissful honeymoon phase throughout a relationship. If we decide to question that claim, however, interesting things happen. First, we get the opportunity to take a step back and simply watch the thoughts that are parading our minds. Instead of blindly following this claim, by questioning it we start asking important questions about why we think and feel the way we think and feel. Why is it, for instance, that you always end up seeking a partner that, to a greater extent, shows affection, like a paternal figure? Or, why do you often feel insecure when your partner talks to you about how much fun they had hanging out with an individual who's the same sex as you are? Simply put, Stoicism teaches us that we don't need to create anything. All we need to do instead is to remove the barriers that are inhibiting us from being who we naturally are as human beings, kind and loving. And, in the process of getting rid of these barriers, we discover ourselves and our biases. Stoic love does not operate well without continuous acts of courage. Loving courageously can mean a few things. The courage to expose your fears and insecurities, or own your mistakes and your limitations, regardless of the associated fears of rejection or admonishment. The courage for commitment and forgiveness. The courage to let go of a loved one, when holding on, is unwise. This requires sustained attention and frequent reconfiguration of what virtuous love means within ever-evolving relationships. 
following on from A.C. Grayling's take on courage that it is hard to accept that to live is to lose, that to love is to lose, that trying to achieve anything of value is to lose, and that the only way to gain what matters is to accept these facts with courage. A Stoic would view the link between loss and courage as natural, and the former not as a negative, but merely a fact within any lived experience to be managed through resilience. Memento Mori Mustering up ceaseless courage is easier when we remind ourselves that nothing lasts. While it is much easier, at least in the short run, to overindulge in pleasurable moments by ignoring their impermanence, remembering that everything is temporary can alleviate any pain we might incur in the long run when those moments do pass. Regard everything that pleases you as if it were a flourishing plant. Make the most of it while it is in leaf, for different plants at different seasons must fall and die. The contemplation of death or more generally of departure can be a useful tool in loving stoically. Such losses, whether through breakups or more impactful ways, can bring great grief amongst other strong emotions. So, before any of that happens, on a sunny day when you and your loved one are blissfully spending the day together, take a moment to envisage a world without them, for any subsequent day can bring that possibility into fruition. Sometimes a lost love is partly up to us, and sometimes it is not. We have to be prepared to purposefully accept both. Giving Love Acceptance Stoic love calls for accepting things be they our partners themselves or characteristics of our dynamic with them as they are. Two Stoic concepts which on the surface seem to contradict each other are relevant here. On one hand, if our goal as aspiring Stoics is to develop our character, and assuming our partner is directly or indirectly striving towards the same ideal, one of our roles is to support their character development. On the other hand, acceptance of what is, the nature of our partner, and the entirety of who they are, things like their temperament, their personality, their spirit, is equally important. This equat is to loving our fate and that of our partner in our shared journey. Together these thoughts render a stoic love, an experience whereby we observe what is, while nourishing what could be in our partners, without trying to coerce what is not up to us into existence. Thus we should love with fortitude. When thinking of love of as an act of giving, we recognize that even though our efforts may sometimes be futile or unwanted, we are bettering and supporting another human through our capacity to show them care, affection, and understanding. Receiving love, indifference. When love, or more precisely, the feeling we derive when we perceive we are being loved, is deemed an indifferent, to our character, we realize we can live good lives with or without the presence of another, oftentimes arbitrary person, no matter how strong an affiliation we think we have with them. Being single or in a relationship does not determine our ability to live well and with virtue. It does not consequently determine our ability to feel safe, secure, and whole within ourselves. Our feelings of true contentment with our life are directly proportional to our success in behaving with virtue. In this respect, by itself, being in a romantic relationship is just as likely to be hindering as it is to be helpful. The conditions that allow us to love and to be loved simultaneously are relatively narrow. Throughout the entirety of our lifespan, these occasions come and go, as fate allows it, but our opportunities to act well are endless and so us reaching equanimity rests exclusively upon us too, not on any link with another being. It might occur to you at this point that loving as a stoic sage would seem to equate to feelings of neutrality towards another, as the paragraph above suggests. You might think that it is a bit harsh, and I would agree. Indifference as commonly defined, i.e., lack of interest, concern, or sympathy for another, is not what the stoic sage would aim for in their acceptance of love. A careful appreciation of what is given to us, but with no expectation that it should forever be granted to us, is what I would expect a Stoic sage to do. As confirmed in biology, the opposite of love is indeed not hate, but indifference. This might perhaps also serve as a caution that signs of indifference for another person are not evidence of Stoic love, but rather just apathy in disguise. 
If a loved one is indeed nothing more than an indifferent in the stoic sense, I say aim to make it a preferred one, one which aids both parties in the development of good character. Desire and Contentment Love as experienced by the sage would be one devoid of desire of any kind, a preferred indifferent. They would recognize that a desire to be loved can sometimes supersede the act of loving causing us in our most intemperate moments to ache for the receipt rather than focus on the offering of love. The latter is in our control, but the former is not. Awareness of this and that receiving affection is a gift rather than a constant undeniable right is important here. Realizing that while we might want for things to go our way in any given relationship, we should be cautious of placing our sense of happiness or rather peace of mind, on what is at the end of the day, an external. Whether we are loved in the way we would want to be loved, or rejected and distanced from, these actions do not belong to us. Every individual can make himself happy. External goods are of trivial importance and without much influence in either direction. Prosperity does not elevate the sage and adversity does not depress him. Seneca on the shortness of life. Being content on your own ensures that living with another only accentuates love as a gift and not as a necessity. Given how strongly the Stoics feel about aligning all of their goals, actions, and lifestyles to the highest virtue, it is safe to assume they would rather stay single forever than knowingly be in a relationship that doesn't align with the greater good. Although it is a thought that might seem somber at first, we can hopefully see, however, how a choice over what partner to have, or even if we should have one, is as important as any other life-changing decision. When selecting our partners, then, we should aim to reason with our impulses and target interactions that are likely to pair well with our wider life choices. In particular, long-term relationships should be results of exercises of reason, whether prompted by initial impulses or not as opposed to a nonchalant ascent to sporadic moments of elation that we have little control over. If you have another opinion about love, share your comments and feedback with us so that the benefit can be spread.